Christians frequently cite the importance of the blood of Jesus, especially during this season as we commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Savior. All this talk about Jesus' blood may seem strange to those who aren't familiar with the New Testament. What's so special about the blood of someone who died on a cross 2,000 years ago? Dr. David K. Bernard explains next. Welcome to Apostolic Life in the 21st Century a podcast dedicated to helping modern-day believers live out the teachings of the first-century church. This podcast is part of the teaching ministry of Dr. David K. Bernard. Dr. Bernard has dedicated his life to studying the Bible and helping believers apply its message to their daily lives. In Apostolic Life in the 21st Century, Dr. Bernard answers your questions about what the Bible teaches and how those teachings apply to everyday life. If you enjoy this podcast, we encourage you to check out Dr. David K. Bernard's books. Dr. Bernard has written more than 30 books on biblical theology and Christian living and leadership. Visit PentecostalPublishing.com and search David Bernard for a list of available titles. Enter promo code DKB10 at checkout to save 10% on your order. That's PentecostalPublishing.com promo code DKB10 to save 10% at checkout. At the end of this week, we'll be celebrating both Good Friday and Easter, and we're going to remember how Jesus died for our sins, and we're going to celebrate the fact that he rose from the dead. And it's very likely that at some point in this week of celebration, we will make reference to, probably many references to, the blood of Jesus. Now, if you're not familiar with Christianity or its teachings, that probably sounds really weird to hear somebody talk about Jesus' blood like it has some kind of magical powers. Why do Christians make such a big deal out of Jesus' blood, and why is it so important? When we talk about the blood of Jesus, we're we're actually following what the Bible says. But it's important to understand when we say we're saved or we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus— We're talking about a concept. Uh, We're talking about God's plan of salvation. And let me give you some equivalent terms. Another term is atonement uh, or a sacrifice for sin. Um, The King James uses the word propitiation, which means a sacrifice of atonement. Um, The Bible uses these terms to describe how that Christ's death provides our salvation. I would also say the Bible is very clear that the death alone was not sufficient because he died, but then he was buried in the tomb and then he rose again the third day. So the resurrection turned death into light, to life, defeat into victory. It vindicated um, Jesus. It showed that God accepted the sacrifice. And so when we say the blood of Jesus, that is a shorthand way of saying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15, that the gospel consists of these three essential points, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We So we can say, uh, or sometimes we'll say the cross, capital C. We're not really talking about the physical wood, but we're talking about what happened at the cross. Uh, and so when we say the blood, we're saved by the blood, we're saved by the cross, we're saved by the atonement, we're saved by the gospel, the full meaning is we're saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not talking about the physical blood as such. Obviously, there was physical blood that had to be shed, but let's put it this way. Uh, when Jesus was crucified, probably his physical blood spattered on some of the Roman soldiers. Did that blood save them? No. Even if they had the physical blood of Jesus on their body, it didn't save them because it's not just the physical blood. It's talking about the real physical blood shed, the real death, but you must have faith and appropriate that or apply that to your life. Same way with the cross. Some people claim to have splinters of the true cross, and they're displayed in cathedrals in Europe. Can you pray to that splinter, even if it was part of the real cross, which I highly doubt? Does it have any efficacy? No, it's not the wood. So presumably, sooner or later, that cross was destroyed. Some pieces of wood may have ended up being used for something else. 
But did that have any magical power or saving power? Absolutely not. Uh, but let's go to the scripture. So, so really what we're talking about is, is the God's plan of salvation expressed from Genesis through Revelation. God created humans to have fellowship with him. We broke that fellowship through sin. Uh, sin separates us from God. Since God is the source of life, he's the creator, and he's the source of all grace, all goodness. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from God, James chapter 1 says. So love, joy, peace, every positive thing we experience is comes from God ultimately. So when we humans live in sin, we break the fellowship with God because God is holy. He cannot have fellowship with sin. So that means we cut ourselves off from life. Even though we may physically survive for a few decades, eventually we're going to die, and then we're going to face an eternity without God. And even while we live in this life, we're separated from God's presence and His grace. So what's the solution to that? How can people be saved from that, that, that physical, spiritual, and eternal death? Well, according to God's plan, He couldn't just ignore it. There had to be an atonement. So Jesus Christ was the only sinless human being. He's the only one who did not deserve to die for his own sin because he did not sin. When he died in our place, when he suffered on the cross, when he was placed in the tomb and his spirit was in the place of the dead, he underwent everything that a sinner would feel, I believe, in the lake of fire. That's why he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he took on the punishment for the sins of the world. He paid the price for our sins. Therefore, if we believe in him and we obey his gospel, to use an Old Testament term, the blood is applied to our lives. Where did that come from? It came from the Old Testament. When an animal was sacrificed, the blood was shed. That was seen as an atonement or a substitute or a covering for sin. But, but as Hebrews explains, the blood of animals could not substitute for humans because we're greater than them. That was only pointing toward the true sacrifice, Jesus Christ. He being a true human being, a sinless human, being the infinite God manifest in the flesh, he could take our place. And he could take the place not only of one person, but for all persons. And not only for a short time, but for all eternity, because he's the infinite God. So in other words, in Jesus Christ, the infinite God took on the punishment of our sins and paid for our sins. Now, when, when God instituted the Passover for Israel, so when Israel was being delivered from bondage in Egypt, God sent an angel of death that would go to every Egyptian household and kill the firstborn, and that was done so that they would finally release Israel. Well, that death angel would come to Ju the Israelite households too, but God said, kill a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And when the death angel sees the blood, it will know you're a believer. It will pass over your house and not visit your house. So it's, therefore, it's called the Passover. So the blood was literally applied. That Passover lamb is signifies Jesus Christ. It's a type and foreshadowing. So just as the ancient Israelites had to apply the blood of the lamb on their doorposts in order to to escape the judgment of death. So we must apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our lives. Now, that does not mean a physical daubing, but it means, and Hebrews 11 explains, it's by faith. So just as Israel kept the Passover and they were delivered, so we live by faith today. How is the blood applied to our lives? Well, through the new birth experience, the repentance of sin, water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let me give you scripture for this to show you how this all fits together. In Romans 3, 21, um, but now the righteousness of God apart from faith is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the key. This is how we apply the blood today, through faith. To all and on all who believe, for there's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, uh, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So here God here the Bible is saying even the people of the Old Testament God had previously just skipped their sins. It seemed like he was ignoring them, but he wasn't. He was waiting because the price would finally be paid by Jesus Christ. Now how's it happen? It's through faith. Of course, by faith that leads us to the new birth experience, but that's another subject. But what you see here he uses the term propitiation, a sacrifice of atonement. So that's the language of the temple. So just as a worshiper brought a lamb to be sacrificed at the temple to cover their sins, so Jesus, by dying on the cross, becomes the sacrifice for our sins by his blood. Then it also uses the language of redemption. Just as you go, a person was sold into slavery to pay a debt, a kinsman could go and pay money to redeem that slave out of his bondage. So Jesus, by his death, by his blood, redeems us from bondage. So those are two different analogies. And then it says you're justified, you're counted as righteous. That's like going into a courtroom, even though you're guilty, and the judge says, we're going to pardon you and we're going to treat you as if you never sinned. We're going to set you free. So the the uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ is is represented in the terms of the, the courtroom, you're justified. In the terms of the temple, uh, God, you, the, the blood of Jesus is your propitiation or sacrifice of atonement. In terms of the slave market, uh, Jesus has redeemed us. So all these are different ways of describing the death, burial, and the resurrection. But it does include the resurrection, as I've already mentioned, because here in the same book, uh, Romans 4, 25, it says, who was delivered up, speaking of Jesus, for our because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So just the death alone wouldn't have been enough. It required the resurrection of Jesus Christ to finish the work. Just like for us, we must repent die to sin, be baptized, be buried with Christ, but we must also receive the new life through receiving the Holy Spirit. And then one more passage that I would like to use to tie this together. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. So we're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But again, it's the spiritual work because if I jump down to verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another firmly with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we're saved by the blood of Jesus, but how does that work? When we believe the message, the preaching, we obey it and we receive the new birth experience, which includes the Holy Spirit. So it all ties in there together. Preaching the blood of Jesus also leads us to preaching the new birth experience. Thank you for listening to this episode of Apostolic Life in the 21st Century. If you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. We also appreciate it when you share apostolic life in the 21st century with a friend or family member. And make plans to join us again next time as we look at how the Bible applies to everyday life.